Welcome back to Am of the Week. Today we're departing from the ocean and heading to the air, so it may surprise you that this week's episode is about a frog. Wallace's flying frog is just one of many species of flying frog around the world, but just like all of those other frogs, its name is a lie. This frog cannot fly. Like many other animals that have flying in their name, like flying lemurs, they can only glide and cannot achieve powered flight like a bird or a bat. However, the reason it's called a flying frog is because there are also frogs that are known to descend from trees, but at angles greater than 45 degrees, which is called parachuting. Because these frogs have membranes across their limbs, they can descend at angles less than 45 degrees, and that is the angle at which scientists have decided the cutoff is, and so the flying frog gets its name. The frog part of its name is 100% true though, because it is indeed a member of the order Anura. The genus is Racophorus, which contains over 40 species of frog, most of which are either the flying or parachuting variety. And finally you may be wondering who on earth Wallace is and why it seems like he owns all these frogs. The Wallace comes from Alfred Russell Wallace, the famed naturalist and contemporary of Darwin who came up with and corroborated the same theories of speciation and evolution that Darwin came up with when observing the Galapagos, except Wallace just did this in the Malay Archipelago. Wallace's discoveries were published in tandem with Darwin's and some credit him with getting Darwin to finally publish The Origin of Species because Wallace's discoveries finally forced Darwin's hand to publish the 20 years of work that he had been hesitant to do so. Forcing his hand might sound negative, but it wasn't. They were both good friends and defended each other's work, and Wallace was happy to be thought of as a co-discoverer alongside the more famous Darwin. It's just that had Wallace not told Darwin about the similar discoveries he was about to publish, Darwin may have taken years and years longer to publish his works. Anyway, Alfred Russell Wallace has this frog named after him because he recorded the first known species to Western science. The fact that Wallace was a naturalist working in the Malay archipelago might give you a hint of where these frogs are found. They are present on Borneo, Sumatra, as well as the Malay Peninsula and other more easterly islands of Indonesia. Obviously this is all wet and humid jungle habitat and that's exactly what these frogs need, enjoying life in the tall trees and gliding between the branches to avoid predators on the jungle floor. They can glide up to 15 metres at a time. These frogs are the largest of their genus, about 10 centimetres in size, making them a pretty decently sized frog. This means they are able to prey upon smaller, less fortunate frogs. They also have been known to feed upon very small birds, because up in the trees they can glide and keep up with them, or ambush them. More boringly, they also eat insects like most frogs do. However, the gliding clearly gives them a predatory advantage, as they can utilise it to quickly attack prey from above and catch them off guard, which is kind of terrifying if you really think about it. Forget the deadly drop bears, imagine being a poor little bird and then a deadly drop frog jumps on you from above. Interestingly, because these frogs are arboreal, they even lay their eggs in the air and not in the water. They come down close to the jungle floor though, closer than they do for anything else. The females will create what are called bubble nests, essentially a sticky sack of saliva and other excretions that sticks to branches above bodies of water. They will lay the eggs inside of these strange nests and the male will move in and fertilise them. This is a much nicer way of reproducing than many other frogs in my opinion, as common female frogs in England have to endure hours of males climbing on them fighting to fertilise their eggs as they are being released. Once hatched, the tadpoles will stay in the nest for a period of time as they develop a bit before the nest breaks open and they fall into the water below. This gives them an advantage as the tadpoles are already partially developed before dropping into the harsh world of the water below them. When metamorphosing as juveniles, they have brown skin which helps camouflage them on the ground. Obviously the membranes between their feet and hands are a big thing here. They are incredibly sticky and possess toe pants which allow the frogs to latch onto trees when they land. If you notice the membrane continues past the hands and attaches between the arms as well to give them extra lift and manoeuvrability. As they glide they will extend and flatten their body with their stomachs bulging out at the sides to offer even more surface area for lift. Their coloration is thought to be mainly for camouflage as they blend into the green jungle behind them, but their underbellies and limb membranes are yellow and black which might suggest some sort of warning coloration. Their biggest threat are tree dwelling snakes like green pit vipers and the likes. They can creep up on frogs and are excellently camouflaged. When younger, larger frogs, fish and anything in the water that likes live prey can easily threaten them. Humans are having an impact upon them with deforestation, but they are still classed as least concern because some have adapted to living in wet farmlands. Though for frogs that like trees, this isn't ideal and makes them more vulnerable to predators. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learnt something new. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it and if you'd like to see more from us.